Now, in Revelation chapter 16, we're getting into the vials of the wrath of God. In chapter 15, the vials were introduced. And in chapter 16, we're going to go through all seven of the vials of the wrath of God as they're poured out. Now, verse number one, the Bible reads, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. And before I get into the specifics of the seven vials that are poured out, I want to explain to you a very important concept, and it's something that I'm going to be using throughout the sermon tonight, and that is the fact that the vials of God's wrath and the trumpets of God's wrath are going to be happening concurrently, or they're going to be happening at the same time. A lot of people believe that first all the trumpets happen, and then all the vials happen, but that is simply not the case. I'm not saying that the trumpets are exactly the same as the vials. Obviously, they're two different things, but what I'm saying is that if you look at the vials and the trumpets side by side, you can see that they go together, and they fit together, and that they are happening concurrently. Uh, that is, during the time that the first trumpet sounds, the first vial is going to be poured out. And during the time that the second trumpet sounds, around that time, the second vial is also poured out. Now, in order for you to understand this, I want to just quickly give you an overview of the whole book of Revelation, just very briefly, just so that you'll understand why it is that the trumpets and the vials overlap. If you start out in Revelation chapter 1, you're in the first century A.D. with John on the Isle of Patmos. Then in chapters 2 and 3, you have the letters to the seven churches in the first century A.D. Then when you get into chapter 4, you enter the hereafter phase of the book of Revelation, where we get into the events where John is being shown what will be hereafter. And in chapters 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, we see a chronology rolled out that is roughly in chronological order that basically goes through the events of the tribulation. Then after the tribulation, the sun and moon are darkened. And then Jesus Christ uh, returns to uh, gather up his elect. And then chapter 7, we have that great multitude appearing in heaven. Then in chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11, we're seeing the phase where he's pouring out his wrath. And that is the seven trumpets. Then when the seventh trumpet sounds, there's a finality there where he says, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. He shall reign forever and ever. And it's an ending point right there. So basically the first half of the book of Revelation, chapters 1 through 11, starts out with the first century AD, then goes through the tribulation, then goes through sun and moon being darkened and uh, uh, Christ's return, and then God pouring out his wrath, and then Jesus is about to set up his kingdom. Well, then in chapter 12, all of a sudden, you jump back in time. 1 through 11 are in chronological order. But when you get to chapter 12, all of a sudden, you're at the birth of Christ. So then it goes through the birth of Christ, which is first century AD. And then it goes through the tribulation in chapters uh, 12 and 13 there. And then in chapter 14, we have Jesus come in the cloud. He reaps the earth of the elect. Then in chapter 15, great multitude appears in heaven. And then in chapter 16, we have him pouring out his wrath with the seven vials. And then he continues his wrath into chapter 17 and 18 with the destruction of Babylon. And then it all culminates in chapter 19 with the battle at Armageddon, which is followed by the millennium, great white throne judgment, new heaven, new earth. So all that to say this, chapters 1 through 11 are in chronological order. But then in chapter 12, everything starts over with the birth of Christ, and we go through the same story again in chronological order once again. So the book of Revelation is chronological, but you have to cut it in half, and then it's two different chronologies. And if you put those two chronologies side by side, you can see that the same things are happening. You know, basically the rapture is covered twice in the book of Revelation. The tribulation is covered twice. The wrath of God's covered twice because of these two halves, 1 through 11 and 12 through 22. Well, with all that being said, if we put those chronologies side by side, the seven trumpets correspond with the seven vials. Okay, now let's look at these and let's compare the two. Let's compare the vials with the trumpets and see how they fit together. The first thing I want you to note is that with each of these vials, they're poured out upon something specific. Glance down at your Bible there in chapter 16, verse 2. Notice it says, the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. So the first vials poured out on the earth. Look at verse 3. Second angel poured out his vial upon the sea. Look at verse 4. 
The third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers. Look at verse 8. Uh, the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. Okay, and on and on. The, uh, verse number 10. The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. And then it says in verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And then uh, in verse 17, the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. So each of the seven vials is poured out upon something specific. Okay? And you're going to see how those judgments correspond exactly with the trumpet judgments. And I'm not saying they're the same thing, because if they were the same thing, there'd be no need to have a separate trumpet and a vial. But they're, they're different things that are happening concurrently. Okay? Let's compare. And I want you to put a finger in Revelation 8 and a finger in Revelation 16, because we're going to be going back and forth between the trumpets and vials, seeing the similarities. So let's look at the first vial, first of all. It says, the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there was a noise, there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. So the first vile judgment is that every person who has taken the mark of the beast gets a noisome and grievous sore on their body. I mean, they're covered in sores. Now look at Revelation chapter 8, Verse number seven, it says, The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. Now look, these are two completely different judgments, are they not? Not saying they're the same. Two completely different judgments. One of them is causing the men that had the mark of the beast to receive sores all over their body. And I'll tell you what, man, that is worse than anything when you have sores all over your body. Remember in the book of Job? When God allows Satan to attack Job and afflict Job, and Job lost all his money, Job lost all of his children, Job uh, lost everything. But if you remember, Satan said, you know what? All that a man hath will he give for his life. He said, let me touch his body now and he'll curse thee to thy face. Because Satan knew that the worst thing is when you're going through horrible health problems. And so Job was afflicted with these boils all over his body, these sores all over his body, and he's scraping himself because of the itching and burning and pain from the sores. And that's when his wife tells him, you know, does, Job, dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Well, that's the type of a thing that people are gonna go through when the first vial is poured out. They're gonna have horrible sores all over their body. You know what I always think of whenever I read this uh, chapter? is I think of those advertisements that tell you not to use meth. Who knows what I'm talking about? These billboards that say like, you know, this is how you're gonna end up if you take meth. You know, basically this is how you're gonna end up if you take the mark of the beast. You know, and they have like all these sores all over their body. That's what's gonna happen when the first vial is poured out. Now the first trumpet on the other hand is hail and fire mingled with blood. Basically fire and brimstone are gonna be raining from heaven. So these are two very separate, very different things. The only similarity in the first vial and the first trumpet is that the first vial is poured out upon the earth and the first trumpet is fire being cast upon the earth. So the phrase upon the earth is found in both. Not a real strong correlation, but as we go through these, you'll see much stronger correlations. Look, if you would, at chapter 16, verse 3. Let's look at the second vial. The Bible says, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Now go back to Revelation chapter number 8. Verse 8, the Bible reads, And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. So both of these judgments are taking place upon the sea. Okay, obviously the trumpet judgment comes before the second vile judgment. Because when the second trumpet sounds, a great mountain burning with fire is cast into the sea, or that's as if what were happening. And then it says the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. When you get to the second vial, it says that the vial was poured out upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. So what we see there, I believe, is that the second trumpet shows us the beginning stages of turning the sea into blood. And then later on, by the time the second vial is poured out, the entire sea 
has turned to blood. You know, it'd be kind of hard to just isolate and turn part of the sea into blood, especially the third part, without it eventually contaminating and killing everything in the whole sea, because all the seas are connected, okay? There's really no doubting that events repeat themselves in the book of Revelation. It's pretty obvious when you see the rapture in 7 and 14, when you see the tribulation laid out in chapter 6, and then you see the tribulation laid out again in chapter 13. And so this all fits if we put the trumpets and vials side by side that they're both taking place at the same time. Just two different aspects of God's wrath. The trumpets of his wrath and the vials of his wrath. Look at the third vial. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters. And they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Go to Revelation 8, verse 10, and we'll look at the third trumpet. So the third vial is poured out upon the rivers and fountains of waters. They're turned into blood. And then the angel is basically praising God for turning the rivers into blood and saying these people deserve to drink blood because they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. They are worthy. You know, often we can look at God's judgment or God pouring out his wrath or God's anger. Or we could even look at the concept of a place like hell and say, well, it's just not fair. But you know what? According to God and his righteousness, it is fair to make people suffer who have done wickedness. And these people that have murdered the saints and the prophets, these people that have murdered God's people and persecuted God's people earlier in the tribulation, he's saying they deserve to have blood to drink. They're worthy. And so we ought never stand in judgment of God. We ought to have the attitude that this angel has that's just praising God for whatever he does. Because whatever he does is right. And it's not our place to stand in judgment of God and say, well, God's being a little bit too harsh here with this third vial. I mean, that's just taking it a little too far. No, God knows what he's doing and people get what they deserve. Look at the third trumpet. Remember the third vial was poured upon the rivers and fountains of waters? Look at verse 10 of chapter 8. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon what? The third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the stars called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. So right there, we see that the first three judgments have lined up perfectly in the sense that the vial was poured upon the earth, the trumpet judgment had something to do with something coming upon the earth. The second vial had to do with being a poured out upon the sea. The second trumpet had something to do with the sea. The, the third vial was poured out upon the rivers and fountains of waters. The, the third trumpet sounds and a judgment comes upon the rivers and fountains of waters. See how they're lining up perfectly? Look at the fourth vial. It says in uh, chapter 16, verse 8, the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. So here we see that the sun becomes very hot and begins to scorch men with great heat. You say, you believe in global warming? I mean, this is global warming. You, know, you hear people talk about solar flares and different things. Somehow God is going to allow the sun to scorch men with great heat. I mean, and we're not talking about, you know, Phoenix in the summer where it's 120 degrees. You know, I don't know exactly what kind of temperatures this is going to get up to, but it's going to get extremely hot and men are going to be blaspheming God because of the great heat. Instead of repenting, instead of uh, turning to God and saying, you know what, we were wrong, we made a mistake, we, we, we were sorry. Instead, they're just going to blaspheme God which has the power over the plagues, and they will not repent to give him glory. Now, you say, well, just turn on the air conditioner. Well, first of all, your air conditioner can only keep up with so much. I mean, I, on a really hot day in Phoenix, I'll tell you right now, our air conditioner never keeps up. When it gets really, really hot, it'll run 24 hours a day and can't really get it necessarily as cool as we want it. But not only that, keep in mind the judgments that have already happened. Fire and brimstone raining from heaven, the sea being destroyed, the rivers and fountains of waters being destroyed. You know, if you think that people's power is going to be on at their house, you got to be kidding. 
There, I mean, infrastructure and society is going to have broken down at this point to where there's not going to be any air conditioning. And I don't know how hot it's going to get. I don't know if it's going to be 130, 140, but it's going to be extremely hot and people are going to be in intense pain and cursing God that they're being scorched. And, and then obviously it's going to cause forest fires because even on just a regular hot day, if you're up in the woods and it's a really hot day, the Smokey the Bear symbol will say, you know, fire danger extreme. Well, imagine the fire danger when the ambient temperature is, you know, 130, 140. I don't know how hot it's going to get. But the hotter it is, the more likely it is that uh, fires are going to be breaking out and bursting. And men are going to be scorched with heat. And then there's going to be fire burning that's just going to make things even hotter, like especially in a city area where buildings are burning and so forth. So the fourth vial was poured out upon what? Upon the sun. So we should expect that the trumpet judgment's going to have something to do with the sun also, right? We'll go over to chapter 8 and let's see. Revelation chapter 8, verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded... And the third part of the what? The sun. See how they, they line up, every single one of them. The third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And so I believe that these two things, although they're very different things, are going to be happening around the same time in the same sequence. So it makes sense that if the sun is having issues, you know, it's darkened for a third part of the day, but then also it's going to be scorching and flaring up on the times that it's uh, visible. Let's look at the fifth vial, chapter 16, verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. So the fifth angel pours out his vial upon what? The seat of the beast. What does the seat mean? Well, seat is often used as a throne or even we use in America the term the county seat. The county seat is basically the governmental head of where the county is administered, okay? So the county seat would be like the capital of the county. You know how countries and states have capitals? Well, the county has a capital. It's called the county seat. The Bible talked about in the Church of Pergamos, he said, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, meaning that's where Satan rules from. You know, that's where his throne is, basically. And here it says that the vial is poured out upon the seat of the beast. Basically, it's poured out upon the area that the beast or the Antichrist is ruling from, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. Now, this is a very important verse here. And the reason why this verse is so important is that this verse proves that the Antichrist is still in power and that this world is still considered his kingdom. You say, why is that important? Because you say, well, Pastor Anderson, I'm seeing correlations between the trumpets and vials, but I'm just not convinced yet that the trumpets and vials are happening concurrently. I still think that all the trumpets are going to happen and then all the vials are going to happen. Okay, but let me say this. When the seventh trumpet sounds, what does it say? The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So if at the seventh trumpet, the kingdoms of this world are become, and that's plural, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now we're looking at this, and what does it say? The kingdom of the beast. So have the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ when the fifth vial is poured out? No. And so I'm telling you, this isn't just a theory or just, well, these are kind of similar. No, the book of Revelation only makes sense when you realize 1 through 11 are in chronological order. Then you start over in chapter 12 with the birth of Christ. And look, God's not trying to make it complicated. When you see Jesus being born... At the beginning of chapter 12, isn't that a hint that we've gone back in time? I mean, that should be obvious to anyone that we've jumped backward in time. And so when the fifth vial is being poured out, this corresponds to the time period of the fifth trumpet because they line up side by side, the two halves of Revelation. And so we see here that the Antichrist is still in power. He still is ruling from his seat. And this world is still considered his kingdom. And his kingdom has not yet become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Very clear. Not only that, but if you remember, 
When the Antichrist fully takes power in Revelation 13, the Bible says power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months, doesn't it? Well, think about this. In the first half of Daniel's 70th week, the Antichrist is taking power. You know, he's on the road toward gaining power. But it's only in the midst of the week that he takes complete power. That's when he receives the deadly wound and his deadly wound is healed. And then the false prophet says, hey, we need to make an image to the beast. And that image is set up, which is the abomination of desolation. That takes place halfway through the seven years or halfway through Daniel's 70th week. And it's at that point that the Antichrist is ruling over all kingdoms and nations and people and tongues. And it is at that time that he has total power over the entire world. That's when the mark of the beast is instituted. Everything. That's halfway through Daniel's 70th week. Okay. And then the Bible says power is given unto him to continue 40 and two months. Now that shows that the fifth vial is being poured out within those 40 and two months because he is still in power. He still has his kingdom. So therefore, when the Bible says that power is given unto the beast or the Antichrist to continue for 42 months, we're talking about basically the second half of Daniel's 70th week. That's the 42 months that he'll be in power. Okay, And so here we see that his kingdom is full of darkness and they nod their tongues for pain and blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. Now look, they still have the sores from the first vial. It's not like, okay, the first vial's over, all the sores are gone, now we're on to judging the sea. Okay, now the sea's fixed, let's go on to the rivers. No, 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 these judgments are compounding. Because you say, well, that's not that bad, a judgment of darkness? Well, darkness can exacerbate a lot of the other problems. The fires, the poisoned water, the water into blood, the sores all over their body. The Bible says they're blaspheming God because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. They're still not changing their ways. Now let's compare the fifth vial to the fifth trumpet. Because remember, the fifth vial judgment, even though it kind of alludes back to the fact, hey, they still have their sores, they're still in pain, they're still suffering from the other judgments that have been poured out. They're still being scorched. The water's still messed up. The main judgment associated with the fifth vial is darkness, is it not? He says that when the vial was poured out upon the seed of the beast, his kingdom was full of darkness. That was the judgment. Look at Revelation 9 and let's see if darkness is the issue in chapter 9. Verse 1, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Sometimes a star in the Bible is referring to an angel. And uh, this, this star that falls from heaven unto the earth, to whom is given the key of the bottomless pit, in verse 11, is identified as the angel of the bottomless pit, or Abaddon, or Apollyon. But look at what it says. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were what? darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So even though these judgments are two different things, can't you see how they fit together? When the fifth trumpet sounds, and it seems like the, the trumpet judgments always come right before the vial. It's like the first trumpet, first vial. Second trumpet, second vial. Third trumpet, third vial. Fourth trumpet, fourth vial. Fifth trumpet, fifth vial. That's how it seems to, to play out. Because look at this, when the fifth trumpet sounds, the bottomless pit is opened or hell is open, smoke comes out of hell and what does it do? It darkens the sun in the sky, which fits in perfectly with the fifth vile judgment, which is total darkness. And watch what it says. There came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. These are locusts from hell. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die and death shall flee from. The Bible is telling us here that people are going to wish that they were dead. They're just going to be begging to be dead because they're going to be in so much pain because they're going to be bit by these locusts that, that basically have a sting like a scorpion. 
And it says in verse 7, the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. These are just basically metaphors or illustrations about what they looked like. On their heads were, were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women. Notice the words like and as, just explaining that this isn't really what they were, but it's just what they looked like. He says their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And by the way, what does it mean when it says they had hair as the hair of women? That they used a curling iron? No, it means that they had long hair. Because the Bible tells us that it is a shame for a man to have long hair, but that a woman's hair is her glory. So when it says that they had hair like unto women, it's saying that they had long hair, is what it's referring to. And then he says in verse 8, And they had hair as the hair of women, their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions. And there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. There's a lot I'd like to say about that, but I've already covered it in Revelation 9, so I'm not going to cover it again. Uh, there's more detail on that in the sermon on Revelation 9. But what I want to point out, though, look back at Revelation 16 again. Now that we know all about what the fifth trumpet entails, the fifth trumpet is these, the, first of all, the bottomless pit's opened, smoke comes out of the pit, blocks the sun, blocks all the light, darkens the sky, darkens the sun. Okay, I mean, just total black cloud over the earth. Then these locusts come out of the pit and they're stinging men with, with scorpion-like tails for five months and they wish they were dead, it hurts so bad. Okay, now compare that again with the fifth vial that mentioned darkness. It says, the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and look, they nod their tongues for pain. He doesn't really explain to us exactly why they're in such pain, but if we compare it with the fifth trumpet, we understand where the pain's coming from, don't we? Because it says that they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented out of their deeds. So sure, they're in pain because of the sores. But also we know from comparing the two angles that they're also in pain because they're being tormented by these locusts that have scorpion-like tails. Let me ask you this. If there were unleashed upon the earth locusts of the description that we saw in Revelation 9 that had these breastplates like iron, basically these are insects that have an exoskeleton that is so strong that basically, you know, you, have you ever come across as a really tough bug and you know, you're stomping on it, it just lives, it just continues to live and it just will not die. I remember when I was a kid, you know, we'd try to drown bees, something, you know, a bee would be bothering us and we'd get it with the skimmer and try to drown it. We'd hold it underwater for like 20 minutes and then the thing just comes out and just bzzz, and you're like, what in the world? You know, how do you kill this thing? But sometimes you'll get a bug with a serious exoskeleton and you're hitting it with the newspaper and just beating it. And it just lives. It just cannot die. Well, obviously, you know, those bugs have a pretty good exoskeleton. But he said that these locusts are going to have an exoskeleton like iron, meaning that, you know, you can try to stomp on them and it's not going to help. I mean, if they, you know, oh man, get it, you know, and, and it's not going to help. They're just going to keep coming. But let me ask you this. If you were faced with those type of creatures, these iron-like locusts that have these scorpion stings in their tails, would you rather do it in the daytime or in total darkness? I mean, think about it. What if you're in the dark and it's totally dark? Sun, sky, totally darkened, complete darkness. And, and you're just basically in complete darkness faced with these locusts. I mean, can you imagine a more hellish outlook? I mean, it's going to be similar to being in hell. I mean, you're burning and stinging from all these scorpions and you're in total darkness. I mean, it's really a horrific outlook when you, when you look at these two things in tandem. Total darkness and you're being tormented by these uh, locusts with scorpion tails. It's pretty bad. Let's look at the sixth vial. Verse 12 of chapter 16, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs came out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty." 
Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So what is the result of the sixth vial being poured out? Or what is the sixth vial judgment? Well, when the sixth vial is poured out, it's poured out upon Euphrates. And the great river Euphrates is dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And then in addition to the drying up of the river to prepare the way of the kings of the east, also these three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Basically one unclean spirit comes out of each of their mouths and goes out to uh, work miracles and deceive the kings of the earth into coming to this battle. Okay, into coming to the battle of Armageddon, basically rallying them all so that they can all be destroyed by Jesus Christ at the battle of Armageddon. Basically just getting them all in one place so that Jesus Christ can just demolish them all and set up his kingdom and defeat them all in one fell swoop. Well, there's so much symbolism of this in the Bible. You know, I was reading the book of Joshua, and this reminded me of the book of Joshua, because there's actually so many parallels between the book of Joshua and the book of Revelation. It's really interesting. Uh, if you look at the destruction of Jericho, compare it to the destruction of Babylon. And I mean, it's a whole other sermon in and of itself, but if you remember all the nations at one point, you know, they, they defeat this city, they defeat that city, but then all the kings assemble and come and attack them at once. And it allows Joshua to really just defeat a lot of them in one go. And Joshua, of course, pictures Jesus. In fact, did you know that the Old Testament Hebrew name Joshua is the exact same as the New Testament name Jesus? That's why it actually calls Joshua Jesus in Acts chapter 7. If you look it up in Acts chapter 7, it talks about them coming into the promised land with Jesus. And it's referring to Joshua. Because you know how names change from Old Testament to New Testament? Like Old Testament Elisha becomes Elysius in the New Testament. Elias, uh, Elias in the New Testament is Elijah. Noah becomes Noe. Hosea becomes Ozi. And uh, on and on. Well, Joshua becomes Jesus in Acts chapter 7. Uh, it actually uses that term. So there's really a lot of interesting stuff. I mean, that's a whole sermon of itself. And I encourage you to study the book of Joshua with Bible prophecy in mind. And there are a lot of correlations. The, the trumpets, and I mean, we could go on and on. But what I'm saying here is that with the sixth vial, the waters are dried up, and then also the, the, the evil spirits go out to gather them to this battle. Now let's compare that with the sixth trumpet. Go to chapter number 9, verse 13. So far everything's lined up pretty well, hasn't it? Well this, to me, this is a very strong correlation. I mean this one is just undeniable when you, uh, when you look at the sixth vial and the sixth trumpet. Look at verse number uh, 13 of chapter 9. The sixth angel sounded and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. And out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. Now, honestly, when I was a child, when I was a young child, Actually, this is the correlation that caused me to realize, even before I understood a whole lot about the book of Revelation, the thing that really showed me the strong, strong correlation between the trumpets and the vials was the sixth vial and the sixth trumpet. I mean, this one just jumped out at me. Because if you look at the sixth trumpet, the first thing that happens when the sixth trumpet is blown is that the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates, are loosed, right? Well, and what is the sixth vial? The waters of the river of Euphrates are dried up. So it's very easy to see how these, these four angels are down in the bottom of the river Euphrates. They're bound in the river Euphrates. And when the sixth angel sounds, they are loosed. Doesn't that fit in perfectly with all the water of Euphrates drying up? That they might be loose, that they might come out. So you can see how these two things happen in tandem. 
Now you say, who are these four angels that are bound in the great river Euphrates, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men? Well, go back to Genesis. Go back to Genesis chapter number three. Believe it or not, this actually goes all the way back to Genesis. And while you're turning to Genesis 3, I'm going to read for you from Genesis chapter 2. Uh, the Bible says in verse number 10 of Genesis chapter 2, And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. We're talking about the Garden of Eden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. These are the four heads of the river that came out of the Garden of Eden. And it says, The name of the first is Pison. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Delium and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hittikel. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. So God specifically tells us about the river Euphrates being there at Eden. Okay? Now go to chapter 3, and we remember, of course, that by the time we get into chapter 3, Adam and Eve have eaten of the forbidden fruit, and because they've eaten of the forbidden fruit, they are cast out of the Garden of Eden, right? Let's look at that. It says in verse 22 of Genesis 3, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, watch this, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, if we study this and we see that there are four rivers, four heads of the river, one of them is Euphrates. He puts these angels at the east of the Garden of Eden. Okay, so he puts them in one place of the Garden of Eden. So it's not that if we have the Garden of Eden, it's not that there's one all the way, you know, at the, at the north side of the Garden of Eden and all the way at the west side and one all the way at the east side and one all the way at the south side because it's a very big area. These four angels are only guarding the way to keep the tree of life. Do you see that? In verse 24, it says they, that he put cherubims, plural, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So they're, they're basically guarding the tree of life, are they not? And they're placed specifically, look at verse 24 there. It says he placed them at the east of the Garden of Eden. So they are all placed at the east. So they're basically placed in one spot where they are located to guard the tree of life. Okay. Well, it's plural. Does it say how many? It does not tell us how many. We know it was more than one because it says cherubims plural. But it says cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Well, when we look at the term every way, we know that throughout the entire Bible and just throughout mankind's history, we always think of four directions. You know, because really, if we wanted to, we could have divided it into six directions or eight directions or five directions or three. Obviously, whenever the Bible talks about directions, we talk about four directions. What are those directions? East, north, east, west, north, south. Those are the four directions. So the fact that there are cherubims, plural, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. If we have basically a cherubim turned each way, with a flaming sword. Basically, let's pretend that this is the tree of life, okay? Basically, we've got a cherubim turned this way with a flaming sword, and then we've got a cherubim turned this way with a flaming sword, and then we've got a cherubim turned this way with a flaming sword, and then we've got a cherubim turned this way with a flaming sword. Then how many are there? There are four, okay? And it's amazing because these four cherubims are placed there with a flaming sword, and it says that they are there to keep the way of the tree of life. And really, there's no scripture or no indication that they're ever removed. I mean, they're just left there to do that. And we know that that is the part of the world where the river Euphrates was located. Now, let me ask you this. In chapter 3, are they underwater here? Of course not. No, because they're there with the tree of life. But they're very near the river Euphrates, are they not? 
because the Bible tells us that the river Euphrates went right through there. Okay, well now think about the fact that there's been a worldwide flood, you know, that could move things around. So if they're still in the same spot, but there's been a flood that could alter things, not completely change the face of the earth, because there are still very much similarities, of course, between the way the earth was before and after the flood. I mean, it didn't just completely change the earth, but it did change the earth, didn't it? I mean, if that kind of water and that kind of cataclysm takes place, things are going to change. You know, a lot of people believe that the Grand Canyon was formed during that time. I mean, there's just a lot of things that could happen with that kind of a fountains of the deep being broken up and that kind of a worldwide cataclysmic flood. Okay, it's very easy to believe that where the river Euphrates currently runs today, which is a major, major river, that these four angels now, God could have worked it out in such a way where they would be hidden from view and where they would be concealed, okay, and where... After the flood, to this day, they are now located at the bottom of the Great River Euphrates at some point in the Great River Euphrates. Now, I, I'm not going down to look for them. You know, I'm just going to leave them alone. All right? I don't want to mess with that flaming sword. But I believe that they're down there. And I believe that someday, the Bible says they are bound in the Great River Euphrates. Someday they will be loosed from the Great River Euphrates. And they will go out and lead an army to kill one third of the human population. I mean, this is going to be a serious army. This is going to be a serious judgment with the sixth trumpet and the sixth vial. And so it makes perfect sense that when the sixth trumpet talks about the four angels being loosed to go out and lead this army of 200,000 thousand or 200 million to go out to slay the third part of men, it makes perfect sense that, that would tie in perfectly with the water of the river Euphrates drying up that they might be loosed. See how the sixth trumpet and the sixth vial go together hand and glove? Okay, let's look at the seventh vial. Revelation chapter 16. And so I believe that the four angels are the four cherubims of Genesis chapter 3. Otherwise, you'd be asking yourself, whatever happened to those you know, four cherubims of Genesis 3? There's so much in Revelation that ties in with Genesis. Just like in chapter 12 where there's the struggle between the serpent and the woman that is prophesied in Genesis 3. And then in Revelation 12, we see that struggle play out between the serpent and the woman. But look, if you would, at Revelation 16, 17. Let's get to the seventh vial. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. Now, isn't that a statement of finality? You know, and he says there, It is done meaning that the seven vials have been poured out. You know, God has finished this phase of his wrath. And it says, And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. So what have we seen so far with the events of the seventh vial? We've seen voices, thunders, lightnings, and a great earthquake, right? And it's such a great earthquake, it's unlike anything that's ever been upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give under the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So part of the events of the seventh vial is that the judgment against Babylon is initiated. He's going to go into great detail on the judgment of Babylon in chapter 18. Now, how long, does anybody know, how long does the judgment of Babylon take in Revelation 18? One hour, right? So the one hour destruction of Babylon, the one hour uh, judgment upon Babylon is going to take place within the scope of the seventh vial. That's why it's brought up in the context of the seventh vial being poured out. He says, that every island fled away and the mountains were not found and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail for the plague thereof was exceeding great. So what do we see if we just take all the judgments of the seventh vial and add them up? We got voices, thunders, lightnings, earthquake and great hail, right? Hail, earthquake, lightning, thunder are the main events there. And the big thing that they're blaspheming God about, the big thing that's making them suffer is which aspect? The hail. Now, the Bible says that the hail 
Every stone was about the weight of a talent. You say, how much does that weigh? Well, different cultures and different uh, nationalities have had different talents throughout history. But if I were to just throw out an approximate number that'll get you in the ballpark of mo what most nations consider to be about a talent, you're looking at 60 pounds. Okay, so imagine, imagine a hailstone that weighs 60 pounds coming down from heaven. I imagine the damage that that would do, because think about this. When things fall, they, they reach terminal velocity. When they fall you know, uh, from that high, they're going to reach, what, 9.8 meters per second? Is that right? But anyway, you know, it's, it, I mean, it's going to be coming down fast. So it's not just that it weighs a lot, but I mean, it's coming down fast. A 60 pound, I mean, that's going to just go through the roof of a house. That's going to go through the roof of the car. That's going to go through just about anything. I mean, that's going to be just slamming down on things. I mean, read it. It says that there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Every stone about the weight of a talent. You're not going to be able to dodge this. A 60-pound hailstone coming down from the sky? How are you going to escape that? And if it hits you, you're dead. Or you're maimed. Or your car is going to be gone. I mean, your house is going to have a big hole in the roof. I mean, this is going to be a very, very serious judgment, which makes sense if it's the grand finale. I mean, if it's the seventh vial. I mean, if this is the last plague, the last of the seven plagues, it's going to be something big, right? Well, it's these giant hailstones that weigh 60 pounds each slamming down. And it, look, it says they're falling upon men. I mean, they're hitting human beings. And so this is a very, very severe judgment. And the earthquake is so bad that every island fled away and the mountains were not found. Now, let's compare that with the seventh trumpet, right? Because we, we, we see that these things correspond. Just as there's a finality of it is done with the seventh vial, there's also a finality of the seventh trumpet. It says in verse number 15 of chapter 11, we're in Revelation 11 to see the seventh trumpet, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven. Now, wasn't the first thing brought up with the seventh vial, voices? It says there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Remember when the fifth trumpet sounded? The, it was still the kingdom of the beast. Remember that? Well, now with... With the seventh vial, now the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, as opposed to the fifth vial where it was still the kingdom of the beast. And it says, he shall reign forever and ever. Talking about the millennial reign, and then, of course, we will continue to reign after that. And then it says, and the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Now this point, he hasn't really gotten into what the judgment is. All we've heard are a lot of voices saying things, right? Just telling us about the judgments. We're going to get into what the judgments are of the seventh trumpet in verse 19. But before we do, I want to just point out the fact that when he says in verse number 18, thy wrath is come. He says, the nations were angry and thy wrath is come. Many will point to that term, thy wrath is come, and they'll try to compare it to the, the verse in chapter 6 of Revelation where it says, the great day of thy wrath is come. And they'll try to say, see, the seventh trumpet and the sixth vial, you know, they line up, they're the same thing. Well, you know, you need to go back and listen to the sermon on Revelation 8 because I put that theory to bed once and for all. I mean, there's no way in the world that the seals do not come before the trumpets. All the seals come before all the trumpets and my servant on Revelation 8 proved that conclusively. But what I want to point out is the colossal difference between thy wrath is come and the great day of thy wrath is come. You see, the great day of thy wrath is one particular day, the day of the Lord, which is prophesied all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament. It's a very pivotal day where the sun and moon are darkened, the day of God's great wrath, the day of the Lord, the day of his wrath. That day is one specific day. 
And so in Revelation 6, when they say the great day of his wrath is come and he shall be able to stand, they're talking about that very specific day of the day of the Lord. But is that the only day of God's wrath? No, because he pours out his wrath over the course of several years, does he not? So the great day of his wrath or the day of the Lord initiates his wrath. That is the special day of his wrath. But doesn't his wrath continue after that? Because what about all the trumpets and all the vials that come after that that are ongoing? I mean, the fifth trumpet alone takes five months. And I believe that all of the trumpets and vials take a similar amount of time. And it's obvious when you read what they entail that they are ongoing judgments that take a period of time. And so there is a period of God's wrath that spans many years and months, okay? So basically, look at it this way. If we were to put it out on a timeline, we have this period, God's wrath, the wrath of God. And it covers all the trumpets and vials. It covers all of these horrific judgments that he's going to pour out. But at the very beginning of that period of the wrath is the great day of his wrath, the day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord is the first day of him pouring out his wrath. But it's not the only day of him pouring out his wrath. It's significant because it's what starts his wrath. So in Revelation 6, we're saying the great day of his wrath is come because we're on that exact day. But when he says in chapter 16, thy wrath is come, basically he's referring to all of the wrath, not just the day of his wrath. Because look, if God wanted to, couldn't he have said the great day of thy wrath has come in chapter 16? But that wouldn't make any sense because it had already come years and years before. But does it make sense to say thy wrath has come? Absolutely, because we're covering all of his wrath, saying it is come. And of course, the verb is come I, I talked about it more or when we were earlier in the book of Revelation about when it said the day of the Lord is come. Is come means that it's past tense, but that it just happened. So in chapter 6, the great day of his wrath had just come, had just happened. Well, in chapter 16, his wrath has now come in its totality just now at this point. So don't let somebody try to say, oh, see, this says the day of his wrath doesn't come until 16. No, chapter 16 does not say the day of his wrath. It just says thy wrath has come. And we know that his wrath is poured out over a long period. When we look at the events of the vials and when we look at the events of the trumpets, they are both ongoing. So I just wanted to make that point quickly. Look at verse 18. The nations were angry and thy wrath has come in the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. Now, I don't understand how anybody could say that the judgment seat of Christ is going to take place years and years before this. He says here that this is when the time has come for the saints to be rewarded and to receive their reward. This is when Jesus is going to set up his throne on this earth, and we will be called before the judgment seat of Christ, and we will be given authority, and we'll be given reward. And, you know, he'll say, be thou over ten cities or be thou over five cities or whatever. And that'll be our reward. Okay, so now let's look at the judgment of the seventh trumpet. Quickly review. What was the judgment of the seventh vial? It was voices, thunderings, lightnings, an earthquake, and hail. Okay, but the hail was 60 pounders. It was a very serious hail. Let's see if the seventh trumpet matches up with the seventh vial, shall we? Because in chapter uh, 16, verse 18, it said there were voices, thunders, lightnings, and a great earthquake. And then in chapter 21, it said there was a great hail. Okay, now look at verse 19 of chapter 11. And the temple of God was open in heaven, and there were seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings, voices, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. Now look, it's the exact same thing. I mean, there's no difference. Voices, lightnings, thunderings, earthquake, great hail. Voices, lightnings, thunderings, earthquake, and great hail. Now, is it crazy to believe that these are both the same event? I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, it's both. The, the only difference in these two things is that the order is reversed between the, the, the lightnings and the voices, or, you know, or the thunders and the light. But all five items are there. Now, if that were the only piece of evidence, then okay. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But when you look at how all seven of them line up perfectly, and when you look at how all seven of these judgments mesh together perfectly, the seven trumpets and seven vials, and when you look at the fact 
that with the seventh trumpet, all the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of Jesus Christ. But with the fifth vial, it's still the kingdom of the beast. Look, God tells us everything for a reason. You think God just happened to accidentally tell us, oh, by the way, it's the kingdom of the beast. It's the seed of the beast. He could have just said, well, the fifth vial, I'm, I'm going to pour out darkness upon the face of the earth. But he chose to mention the fact that it was the kingdom of the beast because he wants us to understand that it is impossible that the vials would follow the trumpets. The vials cannot follow the trumpets because at the seventh trumpet, the kingdoms have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And at the fifth vial, they are not yet because it is still the kingdom of the beast. But if you get it right and put them side by side, trumpets and vials going off, you know, first trumpet, first vial, second trumpet, second vial. And again, people say, you're saying that the trumpets and the vials are exactly the same. No, I'm not. They're different, different judgments, but they're happening at the same time. They go... First trumpet, first vial. Second trumpet, second vial. Third trumpet, third vial. Fourth trumpet, fourth vial. Fifth trumpet, fifth vial. Sixth trumpet, sixth vial. And I think by the time you get to the seventh trumpet and the seventh vial, they are identical. I mean, there is no difference. Show me a difference between lightnings, thunders, voices, and earthquake and great hail. It's the same judgment. So basically, these things, these two things converge. Boom, 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 boom. And that's how it goes. And so let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And these are horrific judgments that we're uh, reading about with your wrath. Thank you that uh, Jesus Christ has spared us from the wrath to come. Thank you that we're not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. But also thank you for judging the wicked people of this world. Thank you that we don't have to get all mad and angry and, and take vengeance. You know, you've told us, vengeance belongeth unto you, that you will repay. So we don't have to get all upset when we see the wicked prosper or when evil men do us dirty. We can, we can know that they will get what's coming to them someday. No question about that as we read this chapter. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. early this Tuesday morning, the 11th of September, 2001. Al, it is such a pretty morning, isn't it? Perfect fall morning. On September 11th, 2001, the world changed. The land of the free has now become the land of the enslaved. The people of our once glorious United States have traded their liberty for security. But has it all happened by design? December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked. Many questions linger about the events of that day, that day of infamy. But one thing we know for certain, the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor set in motion a course of events that would eventually lead us to a one-world government. Japan began this war in treachery. We shall end it in victory. In the aftermath of World War II, the United Nations was created and the path toward a one-world government accelerated. Each war brings us one step closer to what the Bible calls the end of the world. Checkpoints are being set up everywhere. The police state is tightening its grip on the people of the United States. And to those who understand biblical prophecy, what comes next will not be a surprise. At some time in the future, the King James Bible states that everyone on the planet will be required to take a mark in order to buy or sell. 
As our current economic system collapses, and as technology expands, cash is becoming a thing of the past. The reality of a cashless society is not far off. In fact, it's already being implemented. Despite denials by many religious leaders, evil men are working around the clock to bring in a new world order. We can see the end rapidly approaching and the stage being set for the emergence of the Antichrist. We can hear the voices of those who are subverting our U.S. Constitution and promoting this global government system. A new world order. And with all this right around the corner, this film is more important than ever. Satan is working behind the scenes to set up a one world government and a one world religion in preparation for the Antichrist. He has also deceived modern evangelical Christians into believing that they will be removed from this earth before the Great Tribulation takes place. This doctrine, known as the Pre-Tribulation Rapture, teaches that Christ may return at any moment and that there will be no signs of His coming. As a result of this deception, most Christians are completely unprepared for what the Bible has warned us is coming. Although the scriptures clearly state in Matthew 24 and elsewhere that the rapture will take place after the tribulation, big name preachers, Bible colleges, and popular films such as Left Behind have taught the masses to expect that the rapture may occur at any moment. But Left Behind is a work of fiction. Christians today are not being warned about the events they will face in the Great Tribulation. To learn the truth about the rapture, we must look within the pages of the Bible itself.